Hello again. We are in the stop idea, talking about how to shape your product and service. And this is the time for setting goals now and thinking about what happens when we don't reach those goals. So let's start very, very small and um, define what we are meaning actually when you're talking about a goal. It's something measurable, an outcome that can be achieved within a fixed time frame. This is really important, of course, this fixed time frame. Um, you are working within your teams in a sandbox and you don't have an uh, indefinite amount of time to reach your goals. So please be very smart about how to set your goals, how to divide all the work within your team so that you have an end result towards which you can work as a team. Very first <clears throat> terminology here is about smart, effective goals. What does it mean to be smart or to set smart, <laughs> effective goals? Well, the first S here, the first letter in the word smart is standing for specific. So be very specific what it is you're um, looking for. Be measurable, it has to be measurable. So how do you define then if you have reached the goal, if you can't measure it? Find some way of being able to describe that you have reached the goal. You need to be able to take action on it, to, to be able to do something about it. It has to be under your control, of course. And yeah, the R is standing for realistic. It's not always that easy. Um, don't be uh, completely in love with your idea that you don't see reality anymore. And uh, the fifth one is again, the, the time um, dimension that you need to think about, okay? So this means smart goals. If anybody um, has not heard about that yet, it will definitely come up uh, at some point of, uh, of time in your professional life. Now, this is, you know, setting smart goals is also a methodology, uh, if you want to call it like that. And there is pros and cons to that, of course. So. If you define goals in this way, you um, create a very narrow focus and you explicitly define the goals. That's very good, of course, because they make it actionable. You can easily track progress and motivate your team members or employees uh, because it's, it's very clear and you can uh, grab it, basically. Um, you can also figure out if these goals that you have align with bigger goals of you know, a bigger organization that is maybe um, on top of your team organization. And you can easily build deadlines uh, that uh, can uh, boost performance if they do. But there's of course also uh, negative points to it. It could happen that you are just creating smart goals so that you can check off the boxes, right? Because that's what uh, an organization is, is checking. Did you do everything that you have you know, set out to do? And it doesn't really have anything to do with creating actual um, you know, benefits. Um, so then it just becomes a, a alibi um, activity actually. Um, if you set your goals too high, it could of course uh, lead to a fear of failure. And if you have fear involved in your development process, you are already uh, reducing your probability of being successful even more. Um, so it's a um, yeah, very um, sensitive uh, task here to set goals in a, in a way that it really motivates everybody. And um, yeah, by setting goals in this way, um, it said that you know focusing focusing on the goal setting rather than on the execution um, is kind of uh, you know not uh, setting the right framework around uh, actually producing something um, 
that you're setting out to do. There is a new way of creating goals and um, that is you know, showing up in, in lots of, uh, of companies and you know, being taught in universities. They are called the OKRs and um, the OKR goal setting. Um, OKR standing for objectives and key results. So it's uh, a goal now in connection with the key results that you are trying to achieve. In this way, um, you are kind of offsetting that uh, not so good part of the SMART uh, goals that we just talked about, that you know, are focusing too much on, on the goal setting as well and not um, on, the, on the results that you're trying to achieve. So here, they have this combination here and um, you are basically determining an, an overarching goal and then very specific key, um, results, key metrics, again, measurable, and actions that you need to do to make them happen. Um, they say that these OKRs are you know, more um, aspirational, are more motivational for um, the people who are using it. So for the employees or your team members, and it's, uh, it's giving uh, you more freedom um, on how to organize your work. Now let's jump into the um, pros and cons here again. Um, the positive side of OKR is that it, it really allows uh, organizations to, to draw upon the strength of the employees in a different way because they can do their own uh, uh, goal setting and the key is, you know, the, the figuring out the key results or that contribution that they can do uh, to reach these goals in companies. Um, it is used much more often. Uh, this higher frequency allows um, a lot more adaptation along the line. And this is what we need in, in a constantly changing environment, of course. Um, there is more transparency because these OKRs have to be uh, shared with your team members and across the organization. So uh, this allows everybody to see how yeah, things connect, how that puzzle comes together. From my personal experience, I can say that you know, even though you have the transparency um, uh, that I had in one project of the OKRs of all the people in, in the organization, you don't really look at them. So it's, uh, uh, it's not really uh, you know, helping that much, but it will come again, I think, in the, um, in the next slide as well. Another positive part here is that um, you can link the why and the how together, theoretically. It's now on the um, negative side, or it's much harder to, um, to implement this because it's, it's a, a different mindset that you need to have, you need to define your why is and how by yourself. Uh, so as I've said, um, if you're just focusing on your own part and there's not really a, um, a program that allows you to understand how everybody else is approaching this, this topic and what's their results, it, it's kind of hard to, uh, to take the benefit out of this transparency that you might have. Here um, is this, Yeah, a not so easy way of how to align actually really and how to track this ability um, with a lot more goal setting and um, what does this system that you're introducing uh, actually need to properly work. Uh, it sounds very easy, but it's much more complex in the end. One topic that we had as well, um, with the SMART goals, uh, it's always about uh, the motivation, right? How much motivation do you need? Uh, different people uh, set their goals in a different way. Some need uh, you know, very high goals uh, to be able to uh, motivate themselves and others need it in a different way. So um, again, you can't uh, create an easy standard here that works for everyone. There is 
a lot of other ways of you know doing uh, goal setting and how to especially how to make things measurable um, most of the companies that i've you know worked with and the engineers i i mentor and and um, yeah, coach, it's always about the KPIs, these key result indicators that are measured. Um, yeah, different ways of, of, uh, of doing that with key result areas or something called the PPP, progress plan and problems. Management by ob objectives is, is something that uh, has been around for a very long time. But in the end, um, I very much, you know, myself relate to this statement that I found um, in a platform called Quora, where it's, you know, um, the questions are asked about now, what methodology do we choose here the best and in which context? Um, I'm just gonna read that to you. Um, an organizational logic where work is not managed in hierarchies anymore but in dynamic interdisciplinary teams that collaborate on a shared set of goals. That's the only way agile organizations of today can operate successfully in increasingly complex market environments. So this brings us back to the very, very first session we had about peer-to-peer -peer structures um, with no hierarchies, but with um, this self-organized way of uh, yeah, coming from A to B. And here, this is stressed again, we are collaborating on a shared set of goals in a very dynamic way. So um, in the end, it's not about a, a methodology you choose, but about the glue that is there between you and your team members that allows you to constantly adapt and uh, yeah, find that day-to-day -day new motivation to continue. That's what's really comes. Here's another statement. I've been at companies that have tried a variety of methods and they all end up the same. We are focusing on this. Oh, and on this too. And this, of course, we have to keep in our mind. But don't worry, we're not gonna lose focus on that, that, or that. So this is uh, what I've been trying to say now from a, um, another person's mouth. It's, you know, we are really in a very, very complex um, environment these days and ever-changing factors around us. And um, our human brain doesn't allow us to focus on, on many, many things. So um, this is, you know, I would say the challenge we're up against in a nutshell. Um, and that's why you know, my personal response and recommendation always is here. Um, create your dream team in the sense of have the right people with different kind of uh, qualities and strengths and, and backgrounds um, around you. And that, you know, very, very strong drive that you work on these things together. This open climate that allows you um, to do the task that you've set up for, to develop a product or service in a distributed and completely open, transparent way so that you are able to juggle these different balls that you are actually supposed to focus on. But of course, now we are coming to the point of the change uh, that is always necessary. It's about this ability to, to work in, in changing environments and to uh, yeah, not believe in these methodologies or these you know, systems that you have set up too much. Um, it's just too complex for us to understand every different point of view. One very important um, Hint, I would like to add here, you know, it's not always so complex if you are trying to um, cut out different parts of that bigger goal, that product and service you're developing and look at it from different perspectives because there are always parts of your product development process that are simple or that are about 
performing something where um, it's not that insecure and it's not about learning something new where you really know, okay, this is a task that has to be done in this way. And there is a broad um, agreement on those points. So this can be uh, you know, executed upon in a different way. But if it's about learning something new or something complex is there that you're trying to achieve, you have to use different kind of measurements and different kind of, um, yeah, different kind of a setup, um, a space uh, for you to, to actually allow that to happen. It just needs more than just, okay, this is A, B, C that I need to do. And here's the result that I'm gonna get. Okay, so think about distinguishing between performance goals and learning goals, as well as simple and complex goals or tasks. Okay, now at the end, of course, we have to get into action plans, right? It's about what you're trying to achieve. How are you gonna do that? when it has to be completed. And of course, who is gonna do that and who is responsible for that one task you're talking about. And how will we know how we have, uh, you know, when we have uh, reached that goal, this measurable part. Not to, you know, underestimate this, especially when it's about maybe a learning goal or something that is more complex. Um, maybe something is completed uh, for one person and for the other person it's not. So it's a lot about expectations here and definitions uh, in the sense of, you know, do we understand the same thing? If you're using a specific word uh, or a specific description of something, is everybody understanding the same thing behind that? That will help you a lot to uh, um, avoid misunderstandings and, and arguing or troubles in the end. Um, coming back to, you know, with a big question uh, pointer or a big uh, error here to, to um, spend more time with your team to be able to accelerate here when you get into setting up the systems of teamwork. This is of course how this could look like. Um, this is a plan, a resource plan, as you know. I'm sure you have seen that. Um, what I'm missing here is feedback loops. Um, but that's of course the challenge in anything that you're trying to capture in a two-dimensional way on a piece of paper. Um, want to remind you here again about communication. Um, having meetings where you do things together, um, integrating that very prominently into your plans. As I said, things will go wrong. Now let's jump into the um, point of when things actually change, what happens then? As we said, you're planning A, B, C, D, and it doesn't work out this way. Um, you have to find a way to build this change that will happen, but you don't know when it will happen. You have to find a way to build this into your plans. And it's, it's just not helping if you are trying to ignore them. Um, even if they're built into the plans, it's nothing will happen, you know, if you just uh, wait and see. Um, Magical things just don't happen like that. So the very first thing that happens will be emotions will hit you. Um, and um, here is the part to think about how do you deal with emotions when they come up, when things don't work out. Um, I'm often asked, you know, um, do we, do we really need to build this into, into our plans? Um, especially when you are you know, in technology, people are not really open to you know, think about this in an emotional way, but there are emotions. And I think by 
you know, talking about them up front, that frustration that comes maybe with yourself because you're not able to finish something and then you're afraid to tell your team about it or because somebody else has not done something and, uh, you know, the communication really becomes bad after that. Um, and by being able to talk about this from the beginning, it might, of course, happen that, um, yeah, because you have talked about it, um, first of all, it feels different and maybe, um, you know, you are able to overcome when the emotions are there, but maybe um, because you know that you're in a, in a safer space in the sense that, you know, you know, change will happen. You don't know when it will hit you, but it will. Um, that you are prepared in a very much uh, different way uh, to those uh, times and days uh, when it actually hits you. And yes, it does sometimes feel really bad and you feel like, okay, you need to jump out of the window. Um, it's uh, something that happens to all of us. I think this is, um, yeah, something we are not alone with. And that is something really important for coping with these kind of feelings. It might not happen in that bad way uh, in your context, in the sandbox you're working in for now, but then you probably have uh, you know, set up things in a way that accounts or uh, that lets you be flexible around uh, topics when things don't work the way they were planned. Now, what kind of changes could happen there so that we are also prepared from a more um, task-oriented uh, side. Um, personal change can happen, of course, when you lose a team member. Um, we have had this topic before as well. Um, in the team building process, it basically sets you back to zero. And um, that's important to know because if it happens, you know that you have to go back to square zero and start uh, to implement that team member in a way that it actually has uh, a positive effect on all of the uh, the team members and that you avoid the problems that could come out of uh, having a personal change. What's the next one here? The scope was wrong. Well, this is what I have been trying to address when I was speaking about uh, the, the product development methodologies. Um, it's really a cycle, right? If the, the scope was wrong, you're actually not, um, I would say at the end yet, if something was wrong there, that means you have to adapt. You have to realize that you have to go back to the stakeholders, to your customers, to the definitions that you had and uh, keep on refining this to, to come to uh, that result that you're looking for. Um, that's the argument well, that's the main reason why I keep on recommending to, to document uh, decisions very well throughout the development process, because you will know where you have made certain uh, settings that you may have to adapt and why you have done them. So this adaptation process becomes easier uh, if you can draw upon all the resources that you have documented and those um, whys that have happened that otherwise get lost and then you cannot draw upon that uh, power of knowledge. The technology was wrong. Um, that happens often, I would say. And if you're not a techie person as I am, you know, I'm not like these experts that you all are. Um, it's very much like a cloud for me to understand why something was wrong and why this could have not been predicted beforehand. Um, so uh, if you're working with customers, with other stakeholders that are not uh, coming from the same domain, and I hope that you are working with such people because the more you know, diversity you have in terms of knowledge on your team, the better it is. So you have to prepare for this. Um, and uh, yeah, be ready for, for changing your technology um, on the way. I think there's one more, which is of course the one we have uh, always um, touched already. Um, 
especially when you are in an industry where there's a long development, product development uh, cycle, um, markets can change. But so many changes are happening every day that it's, uh, you know, of course, uh, that's what the main driver of, of, of how we are living in our societies and economies these days, that conditions are changing so much. This actually calls out for having, you know, not just one plan or one goal, but having several ones to be able to juggle those goals and, and see whatever, you know, fits uh, the best to the conditions on the market um, when you are ready for that. And that's actually another call out for me to, um, yeah, speak about co-creation again. Um, that's where you have your closest ear to the, to the market and um, you get the first hand information from the customers when things change. I would like to uh, come to the word that I've used before, fear. Um, you know, when, when things are so volatile and you cannot really grasp them, there's nothing sure anymore out there. Um, it's not that easy to constantly be positive because you know things change, frustration hits, and then you have to change it again. So it's like a constant up and down. Um, and um, it's sometimes hard to find your motivation again. Um, but I really love that um, you know, different kind of interpretation of the word fear, standing for false evidence appearing real. Uh, this is from Dr. Norman. Hale, the, the father of positive thinking. So we, we have to find that, that access in us um, that allows us to stay positive in the end. Yeah, this is, uh, I hope you have, you, re, you remember that from our very, very beginnings where I've uh, already uh, brought this. It's, it's important to, to ride the waves to, to find that positivity again. And with that, you know, a little bit of a distance, we, we can stay cool and open and uh, learn or, you know, become comfort comfortable with enjoying the ride, these ups and downs, um, because there is no other way. <laughs> uh, we have no choice um, around that. We have to find ways to stay cool. So thank you very much for listening. It's time to call upon your questions, your observations, your thoughts that have come up with the idea that you are developing in your sandbox.